Jenny, welcome to Q. Hi. I had this moment when Alan Alda cool. said to me, he because he's kind of like everybody's dad. You ever met him? No, I'm a fan. He's kind of like, hey, how's, you know, hey, great job on the interview you're doing here. And like, as you're doing it, he makes you feel good. And oh, great, lovely microphones. And this place is just amazing. And you know, it reminds me of a, a property of improv. It's called Yes And. And what it is, you say yes, and then you have to add something else. And That's like, the rule. That's the foundation of improv. Did you do any improv, like in your acty days? Yes, I have done improv. I don't know if I'm very good at it, but a friend of mine uh, took groundlings classes in Los Angeles, which is like where Will Ferrell came out of, and said uh, it's pretty hard sticking with yes and. Yeah. But, but I try to do that in my life. That's been my mantra since New Year's. Well, my best friend's mantra is be unflappable, oh. which I think is really good, and mine is Yes, and. It is good. Hey, I find it good in this job too, right? Because, you know, because I find like sometimes I got a way like, oh, I'm going to talk to this person. I'm going to figure out what you know, we have a plan here. But then sometimes I find if I just kind of go where, where it's going, everything's going to be okay. You well, know? isn't it more interesting when you just kind of go with the flow? I guess. And isn't there nothing worse than when you're like being creative with somebody and they just shut it down? Oh, my gosh. Co-writing, like writing a song with someone who shuts down your ideas. It's like a no-go. Watch this. Yes, and. That leads me to this album. Because oh. this is your, you wrote everything on it by yourself, right? Good segue. Thank you. Yes, and. Yes, and. Yes, manned. You wrote everything on it, right? I did. Every song. And I've been writing on my own since I was 14 or 15, but I've been in so many different bands and side projects that the collaborative process is really fun writing if you're working with someone who's yes, and. Mm -hmm. uh, but this record... It just uh, felt like I had to be the sole narrator. I loved that Rabbit Fur Coat record so much when it first came out. Thank you. I didn't know Rattle, Rattle Kylie very well. Oh, wow. You're one of, yeah, the few. I yeah. feel like most of the people that know me found out about me through my band. So they're always like, when's the band getting back together? It's like, I've done all the, well, let but me it's, just, come let on. Me just, let me just get rid of that question. Can I, can I? Of all, can I do other stuff? No, I think it was around the time that I started to kind of come out as a country music fan. And I liked Gillian Welch, and I liked um, Old Crow Medicine Show, um, and that kind of thing. And then someone said, "Oh, you know, the girl from Rydal Kylie has a country thing now." And I went, "I don't know. I don't know what that is, but I'll, 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 I can't wait to hear the country thing." And I really loved. It. I still think I still play one of the songs every now and then oh, at home. Thank you. The one that um, "Have Mercy, Have Mercy, Have Mercy" on the me. big guns. Yeah. Yes. Great song. Thank you. So like yes. so this. Was was it the content of this album that made you want to write it all by yourself? Is it it's personal, so you didn't want to have anyone else in on it? No, it was just I was on my own, coming out of a twelve year relationship, and I left um, my hometown of Los Angeles, and someone was staying at my house, and they ended up getting pregnant and having a baby in the house, so I didn't return when I thought I would, and I was just sort of out in the world, and I would write when I could find a piano and and it just turned out that, yeah, I was kind of on my own, writing to my life and vice versa. Did you find you were writing about different things because you weren't writing with anybody else? No, the themes have been broad since I've been writing, but they were unedited by someone else. And co-writing is, you know, that there's like a process of editing where you're working with someone and if you have a good flow, you kind of like know how to edit, edit each other's work musically, melodically, lyrically. But this, I, I didn't really want anyone's input on the storytelling. Why not? I don't know. I just knew that I knew what I wanted to say. And it, it took me a while to hone things. Like I edit for months, sometimes years on songs. Yeah. But yeah, I just knew that whatever it was, I, I had to just say it. Did the, did the pregnant person move out? Uh, the Yes. And the, the baby lived in the house for six months and it sort of like changed the energy and then I moved back into my home that's nice and so it goes yeah when I because I, re I read this quote from you I think I got it right is that you said I never felt fully myself when I was co-writing well that's the idea of co right collaboration it's not about it's not a solitary thing does it make you look differently back on your older records or older songs you may have co-written with other folks no no, because I think it's all a part of the process. If you're a writer, if you're an artist, you're 
collaborations are so valuable. You le- I learn so much every time I work with someone. Yeah. They're like little tricks to songwriting, little tools. And so I, I love all the stuff that I've written with people, but um, it is interesting when I'm playing my own songs, I can remember them top to bottom. But if I'm singing a song that I've co-written, like there's a song on uh, my album Acid Tongue called Carpetbaggers, and I swear I cannot remember the lines that aren't mine. Isn't that interesting? Who, who's <laughs> who's the co-writer? Uh, Jonathan Rice, my ex. Your ex, right. Yeah. And we wrote a ton of songs together. Right. Um, and that's also really beautiful, being in a relationship with someone that you can also kind of create these things and work on them while you're lying in bed watching Forensic Files or whatever. You know, you're like, let's pause this murder scene and talk about the bridge, shall we? Are you fully generative? Do you, are you like, um, do you sit down and it all comes out at the same time? No, no. I mean, sometimes a song will come out fully formed. Like, uh, there's this Rilo Kylie song about Elliot Smith called It Just Is. And I wrote it right after he passed away, and that just came in one full feeling. Mm. But most songs I kind of start, and then I just chip away at them. Like melody, you start with the melody. It depends. Sometimes a, a yeah. phrase, sometimes a melody. But then the words are something that I really hone and tweak over time. I saw one the other day, Taylor Goldsmith and you know in Dawes. Oh yeah, he's a friend of mine. How good is that band? I was watching his. I was on his Instagram, and I've never thought about writing like this before. But essentially, all he does is he writes down ideas for titles. Oh wow! And whenever a title idea comes from him, he writes it in a book, and then when he sits down with his guitar, he looks at his title ideas and writes based on that. See, there's there's so many different ways to do this thing, and when you collaborate, you learn these secrets from yeah. people. Yeah, like I might I might try that. It's cool. I mean, what, what I do is I what I've been doing recently is because a friend of mine who's like a he writes hits for people in Nashville and stuff like that, and he says to me like, if I don't get it in 15 minutes, it's gone. That's it. I'm done. If I don't have a song in 15 minutes, I don't go back to it. Nashville's interesting. I yeah. live there part time now, and I've never been in like a writing situation in Nashville. But apparently, if you're in the room, you get 50 percent of the publishing. Write a word, get a third is what they say. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd love to be a fly on the wall in those rooms and like learn about pop songwriting because I've never written pop music in that direct way. Yeah. You know, it's like poppy in that I grew up listening to pop music. So the melodies that I come up with are kind of derivative of that. But to, to like learn those little tools and tricks. Maybe something else. It's I mean, fun. if I could write a hit, I probably would have already. Oh, you kind of did. I mean, so I guess indie hits are kind of different than the, like, just, actual hits. But just one of the guys was a bit of a hit, right? Kind of an indie hit, but which is great. I'm hit, stoked. Hit to me. <laughs> <laughs> and our friends, like I, I'm it's a shirt. Friends with the hit to me. It's Your a song's hit. a hit to it's me. It's a hit to me, baby. Love you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but we call it like our my friends who write songs that aren't necessarily mainstream. We use the language like play that hit. Even if it's not an actual hit, play that it's Daniel, a friend hit. Play that Daniel Johnson hit. So many hits. So many hits. Um, you, you were talking about your partner, and you were talking about how you guys would watch Forensic Files and pause and um, and you know write a song together. But the Red Bull and Hennessy song you played, like I, I I read that you wrote that he was in the room at the same time, and it actually kind of predicted the breakup, right? If you want to talk about it. Oh sure, yeah. At this point, I've. I've talked about it, so here we are. Jesus. My life is an open book. I only say what you want to say, by the way. Oh, no, and I have found that the more open I am in my life, the easier it is for me in the end. So my openness is a a choice. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Tell me the dirt. Where are the nudie pics? (laughs) Not in the cloud. (laughs) Tell you that right now. Staying out of the cloud. Headless and not in the cloud. (laughs) That's another shirt. Well, I was reading about that woman, (laughs) Bella, the actor who's... Her, her pictures got leaked, oh, no. and Whoopi Goldberg made a comment like, "Well, if you're, you know, a kid now, like you should probably know that if the pictures go in the cloud, they're fully accessible to hackers, so you should be careful." And she got very upset, which I understand because it's not her fault that she was hacked. However, if you take a naked picture, assume that everyone's going to see it. Yeah, just assume that everyone's going to see it. So, headless. <laughs> Headless and not in the cloud is is a great hit. <laughs> Don't trust the cloud. <laughs> so hold on. So you were so hold on. T- 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 tell me the story then. So you guys were in the same room and oh, just it, it's more about 
predictive songwriting where if you if that channel is open where you're kind of like I feel like songs come through me it's not an intellectual process it starts with something that's a little bit magical and so if the channel's open I feel like I write things I don't even understand what I'm writing it takes a couple of years and then I understand the lyrics. You know, I'm kind of like expressing this like deep stuff. So this was, I wrote that song a couple years before we broke up. So hold on, let me just get this right. So like you, you will write something, words, phrases, and then only realize what you're writing about later. I mean, I understand the tone of what I'm writing. Yeah. But when it comes to the specifics of the lyrics, I don't fully understand them until later. And then it will be, exactly what's happening in my life two Freaky. or three years has, has that happened oh mo- throughout my entire uh i guess you could call it a career my entire life as a as a writer it's weird that is weird because it's the unconscious you know it's like the what you feel so if you're open to that and I'm not like a songwriter where I'm, I'm, I'm not like a comparative songwriter. I'm not like, I want to write a song that's like a Tom Petty song. Yeah. Where a lot of my friends write songs based on other songs. Right. Or uh, one of my friends will like turn down like a Bob Dylan song or a Neil Young song, like where you can barely hear it and then kind of like write over what you sort of hear. So when did you realize that this, you were writing about a, a soon-to-be breakup? Was it after you had broken up? Yeah. And every time I sing it. I was going to ask how you feel every time you sing it. I feel s- something. <laughs> I don't, if, I don't, if I'm not feeling something, then I'm not doing my job correctly. So, like, for me, the goal is to, like, and this sounds like hippie stuff. I'm from California, but, like. This is public radio. What are you doing? Don't worry, don't worry about <laughs> yeah. it. It's okay. Hello, my friends. Yeah, but, uh, my people, my people. They say the same beats one. Yeah. Chill out. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> But I do feel like it's this process of... Please don't kill me, Zane Lowe. No, I'll love Beats one, please. Hey, yeah. Uh, yeah, like you kind of channel this thing and and then later you're forced to relive it every night of your life on tour and connect to the material. And so some nights it's devastating. It's so sad. And some nights it's like really joyful. I want to I want to ask a question about that, but I want to get another thing out of the way so that I can talk about both those things in the context of what I want to talk about. But you also lost your mom. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Thank how, you. How old was she? She was um, almost seventy. What was her name, if you don't mind? Linda, which I think means pretty. Linda Lewis. Linda Lewis, legend, total legend. Legend, Linda Lewis. Unbelievable human, really uh, creative bright, great singer. Um, And uh, we're actually talking about her epitaph right now, which I always write my own epitaphs. What's your epitaph? Uh, Well, I've got a couple options. Uh, The first one is one up from the cheapest, (laughs) which is my policy in life. On wine. Wine, whatever it is, just one up from like Tempur-Pedic mattress, one up from the cheapest. (laughs) So that's one of mine. Oh, my second choice is... I could probably live here. Oh, good. I could probably live here. <laughs> I could probably, because I'm always like in different towns, like I could, I could live here, yeah. Col- Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Or, or it's Regina, a, I could probably live I here. I finally lived here. I finally, <laughs> forever. And you're, and what, what's your mom's? Uh, well, I'm auditioning with my sister, uh, a true original, Linda Lewis, a true original. Oh, that's actually really nice. Yeah, and it's totally true i'm catholic so we just get like bible verses on the back of ours boring i know Though you want to like identify cool people in the graveyard right like if you see something that's like, like in nashville i went to visit johnny cash's grave have you ever done that no do that it's off of gallatin which is this big road that goes through east nashville and you just take this road and it's like this small cemetery and they don't allow real flowers at this cemetery maybe it's a southern thing but they're all plastic fake flowers on all of these graves what and you like walk up this like winding road and there's johnny cash and he's buried next to june Uh and it's like you know there's like a bible verse but then there's this guy called like kilgore is his last name 
And he clearly, like, got the grave next to Johnny's. And it's, like, a picture of him with, like, his rings on and, like, a picture of his dog. (laughs) And then he's got, like, another satellite grave. And then there's uh, a gravestone that has a for rent sign on it. Oh, that's so funny. And I was like, well, it's available. Maybe I should just, like, get it now. I can live here. And, like, I could probably live here. (laughs) Yeah, I can can do this. But point is about this Kilgore Kilgore guy who wrote one of Johnny's hits with him. We'll have to look it up. Yeah. He was actually in Folsom Prison. He was was the guy (laughs) who went. Yeah, yeah, he was the guy who went. But really, you're like, you get a sense of this guy's personality from beyond the beyond. So hold on. So I want to go back to your mom here. Given that you rape... So often you can write predictive songs that you only realize you were experiencing a really intense and profound emotion like years afterwards. When you go through an actual intense and profound emotion, and I can't think of many more than losing a parent, right? Yeah. I know. It's crazy. Do you, are you able to write reactively then? Does that change your process at all? Does that change your art at all? Well, I'm always teetering on the line of, of, feeling like I'm exploiting my own life for my work, even though I think it's my right to write about my experience and what else am I going to write about? It's all I know. So it, there, there's a song on the album called Little White Dove. And I was writing that while I was visiting my mom in the hospital. She was very sick. And it was therapeutic. It was a therapeutic device where I would, you know, drive to the hospital every day, smoke a joint in the car, in the parking lot, and just like go in. And I had this melody in my head. And the words weren't really sorted, but I had this feeling and a groove and a melody. And I would go in and hang out with her and she would sing with me. Oh. And she was sort of in and out of like medicated consciousness. They but sing the song you guys, you were Yeah, she, well, on? she's just a, she was a great harmony singer. I learned how to sing from her. She was a... Uh, Las Vegas lounge singer. Oh, cool. And she had a band with my dad called Love's Way in Vegas. So she just, when I start singing, she starts harmonizing. But she's she was singing this song that was about the process of dying and forgiveness. And I hadn't yet written the lyrics, but I had this melody. So in the moment, it was, you know, inappropriate, I felt, to write exactly to it. But then with a little perspective and time, I was able to kind of go back and piece together the story. What's a, what's a lyric that reflects that story in that song? I know it's a bit on the spot. Uh, no, no. Um, well, there, well, there are just so many things that happen in that state, that emotional state. You know, if you're open, which I urge people to show up for this stuff, because I, w- I didn't want to show up for it. I was scared. Yeah. But I showed up and like magical things happened. Yeah. And it all happened within me. And it wasn't, you know, when yeah, we all have our stuff with our parents. Yeah. And we have our issues and it it never happens the way you think it's gonna happen, forgiveness or that talk you have with someone. The strings, the full house strings don't play in the background is what I often say. No. But if you're if there's it's a feeling, if you're open, I feel like these beautiful things happen. So it was like I uh, there's a there's a line in the song that says, uh, are all the guardian angels at the door with their long white coats and their stethoscopes. That was just like a little snapshot. Like these beautiful people that dedicate their lives to like taking care of us. So moving and so beautiful. So the song is just like a series of just little snapshots from that experience. They call it hospice care, right, in the U.S.? They well, call- ho- I, I, this is also something that isn't clear until you're in it. Yeah. Like what hospice is. Yeah. What is hospice? What is palliative care? I didn't know these things. Yeah, that's what we – so my, my, my dad passed and, like, we went to – we were in palliative care. That palliative. Yeah. Is that how you Yeah, know? we were in that thing. And, like, I, it's funny you remember that because I remember sitting here and, like, about, like, you're kind of, like – you know, on CNN, they t- they count down the debates, and you're like, oh, 52 hours left until. But you're kind of doing that. You're kind of like, this time is coming. Like a a very emotional, hard to deal with moment is on the way, and there's nothing I can do about it. I got my brother, and my sister near me. Everything's gonna be okay. We sang songs. You know, he was a singer too. We sang songs, and we sang, uh, I'll you know, we sang I'll fly away. Like my dad was like a, a union guy, but he loved folk music, and we sang that stuff. But I remember even in that in- intense sadness even realizing that the people who work every single day in these hospitals, these palliative care units, 
every day, every day they deal with people who die, are the, I said they're actual angels. They are. They're angels. They really are, you know? It's incredible. It's it just to be around people who are so vulnerable. I mean, it's such a vulnerable time. And there, there was a moment, well, just before my mom passed, and they had moved her for, she didn't even really make it to hospice, but um, they had moved her from the hospital, and there was just a, a, a woman working in this nursing home that was, like, not the greatest nursing home. You know, our medical care is, leaves a little something to be desired in the States. and But there was this woman that just came in not long before my mom passed, and she did this little prayer over my mom. And not not something that I was going to do, but it was she took it upon herself to kind of usher her in in her way through her like culture, and it was one of the most beautiful gifts ever. It was one of the most moving things I've ever witnessed in my life. This complete stranger saying this Catholic pr- prayer above mm, my mom, you mm. know, and I thought it was so kind, so kind to my mom, but also so kind to my me and my sister. It really, it really does highlight. There's a, a lot of beautiful moments. I really enjoy. I mean, I, I just found out we got a couple of minutes left, but I, oh. I, I wanted to keep talking to you. Can I get two things from you? One, yes. The reason I brought up your mom and and, and your your ex partner, because you said something. You said like when it can feel quite emotional to get up on stage and relive these things every night. But I've also heard this. I've also heard that when you look out and you see people singing, singing your lyrics, these deep, deep emotions that back to you. It can make you feel like you're not in it alone. Do you ever get that? Yes, and I I feel the love, and it is circular. You know, I'm giving out there, and my job is easy compared to most jobs. You know what I mean? Like playing music. I wake up at noon. You know, like I I my life. I'm truly grateful, but in those those moments of like love and the circular thing and support it's like truly extraordinary to be able to share and receive because i'm i'm receiving from the crowd so much uh support and love but but the flip side of that on some nights it feels a little embarrassing <laughs> like i get a little shy like oh gosh I'm, this is really serious stuff and i'm just up here you know it feels very vulnerable you know yeah and i used, used the word exploitative earlier which is not how you should feel but i know what you mean well you don't i don't want to hurt anyone yeah i mean i feel listen what's my job <laughs> yeah. you know talking about this stuff right yeah yeah i get it i don't want to hurt anyone but at the same time it's a catharsis you know i want i want to just I, I meant to ask you this and if i don't ask it i'm going to get mad so uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, forgive me for a second i got one last thing i want to know um i just think about you like you grew up kind of famous and you grew up with famous people in your life and you were in a famous band and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Did you still get kind of freaked out when, Ring, when Ringo Starr played on your record? Yes and no. I, I was honored. I was a little bit nervous. Yeah. But there's something that happens with the tribe of musicians. Yeah. We're in a tribe together. I know No matter mean. who you are. If you're playing in the lounge in Vegas or you're Ringo Starr, we're all in it together. So musicians are my people. So it took no time. Because I'm sure when he walked in, you were like, oh, that's going to go star. I was like, there he is. But he was so nice and so easy to be around. Mm-hmm. He's just easy to be around. So he put me at ease. And then we got to work. And he was very kind and, you know, about the songs, which I thought was really, really cool. Like he laughed at the funny lyrics. Like there, there's a line... In a song that he plays on, it's called Head's Gonna Roll. And there's a line about a, a narcoleptic poet from Duluth. And we were listening back in the control room at, at Capitol Studios B. Pretty heavy spot. And Ringo laughed out loud. Uh, and I was like, yes, ho, ho, ho. my job here is done. He, yeah, he gets it. It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> That's awesome. It's nice talking to you. Nice talking to you.